And we are live, 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 live this October 18th in the Americas. It's 4 p.m. here in Vegas. And over across the Pacific, it's 9 a.m. in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. So hello, Rhonda Green. Great to see hello. you. Hello there. It's already October 19 here. The sun reaches. Yeah, well, actually, the sun reaches you first, then comes across, but crosses the date line. So it reaches us before it goes around the world again and reaches you again. So, yeah, it's already when it's already 19th. Well, we are figuring out this time right. and figuring out how to continue some of these conversations. So, um, Rhonda, we've known each other oh, online for more than 20 years. So you're wearing your Wildlife Tourism Australia cap today. So... Um, We'll get into it. I just felt for it because I do have a physical cap, but that's with Eric Area. <laughs> yeah. Got a wildlife tourism shirt I should have worn today. Hello. Anyway. No, no worries. Uh, well, we are recording live. Uh, we're trying to figure out the Google Hangouts in 2017, how to get comments. Not exactly sure. So if you are watching this live, uh, you know, tweet at me or use the Facebook page. Uh, find out some way of connecting. And if you're watching this on demand later on, again, questions and uh, comments are most welcome. And we're planning on doing this as a series of conversations to introduce Wildlife Tourism Australia to everyone and to promote this big event that's coming up in a whole 12 months. So Rhonda, I'll let you take it from here and uh, please introduce yourself to the people who don't know you yet and let us know a little bit more about Wildlife Tourism Australia. Okay. Well, I'm Ron Green. I'm a zoologist. I'm, I also run Eco Tours, and I'm currently the chair of Wildlife Tourism Australia, a national organisation that we started to, uh, to support the um, sustainable development of a diverse wildlife tourism industry that supports conservation. So, yeah, we expect our members to take wildlife conservation, animal welfare, uh, quality interpretation, and equality amongst um, the human components very seriously as well. So, uh, yeah, we've been going since, I think it was 2003 we started, something like that. And uh, we've had a number of conferences, a number of workshops. This particular conference, I'll just try to see if this works and show you our title for, yeah, I think that's it. Is that? Really? We're not seeing anything yet. Seeing anything there we yet. are. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. So you're seeing the, um, yeah, the title of the conference. Yeah, Values and Challenges. Balancing the needs of wildlife, tourists, operators and residents. The wildlife itself, the animals themselves, sometimes get a little bit, um, uh, ah, sorry, just yeah, get a little bit left out. We, when we look at stakeholders, well, the, wildlife's, the wildlife themselves are stakeholders. We affect the wildlife um, positively and negatively. What we're trying to do is to increase the positive try and let, let the tourism dollar pay for conservation projects, uh, try and educate people a little bit more about what the, t what the wildlife needs what the, um, and how to view them in a minimal impact way, uh, not to go to places that exploit the wildlife in a way that actually affects them, either conservation-wise or welfare-wise. I mean, there are still some Terrible little zoos, unfortunately, that keep animals in tiny little bar and cement cages and that sort of thing. Or um, uh, places where the wildlife is you know, rather badly disturbed while being viewed. But there's also a lot of excellent places, captive wildlife that are kept um, for public education, for research and for conservation breeding in excellent conditions. And uh, wildlife tour operators that really do the right thing. So yeah, we, want to, uh -oh. <laughs> uh, we want to um, we want to emphasise the positive benefits that wildlife tourism can have for wildlife, and um, 
minimize, I can't say eliminate because we never completely eliminate, but at least minimize all the negative effects. Um, at the same time, we need to be mindful of what the tourists want. The tourists want to see wildlife. They don't want to be just told, oh yes, well, there are wombats out there if we could go out and look for them, but we're not going to see them. They want to actually go out there and see them. Uh, they want to enjoy themselves. They want to be safe. They want to be comfortable. Well, comfort matters to some tourists more than others. Some want the five-star accommodation. Others are happy to rough it. And there's a whole range in between. Uh, and some just can't rough it. Uh, people that have a hip replacement or uh, yeah, other problems that um, they just they'd like to go out in the wilderness, but just can't. So, but basically, we've got to think about what tourists need and want. Balance that with what the animals want. Someone might want to uh, go and pick up a frog or something to have a closer look at it, which may not be a good idea if they. Um, if they have something in their hands and so on, you know, we've got to balance what the two and someone might want to take a close up photo using a flashlight of an owl or a possum, which isn't going to do it any good. So, there's limits to what we can let the tourists do, but there's lots that we can let them do to give them a very enjoyable experience seeing, interacting, learning about wildlife. Okay, then what the tourism operator needs. But of course, well, a lot of the tour operators in Australia and others that I know are in it because they really love doing it. And they're really committed to conservation, to making people feel good and all the rest of it. At the same time, they need to make enough money that they can keep going. Um, there are some other operators for which money is the main thing, of course, and we're not so interested in those operators, but even those who really have the right ideals, they need to make enough money to keep going. So the, uh, And uh, we need to be mindful of that. Some things that the purists say <coughs> every operator must do, sometimes they just simply cannot afford to do. And then there's the local residents. Um, also, tour operators sometimes are, uh, sorry, before I get into the local residents, tour operators are sometimes expected by their guests to go early morning bird watching, lead them all day, do all their meals, and then go late night spotlighting and maybe end up with about five hours sleep, which isn't terribly safe when they drive the next day. So again, there's balancing the needs of the tourist and the tour operator. Um, then we get to the local population. Wildlife tourism can be wonderful, actually, for the local population. Cl uh, Clyde Tisdell has done studies showing that, for instance, um, the Turtle nesting at Mon Repos, which attracts a lot of tourists, has done wonders for the economy of that area, not just for the... Me, where? Where is that? Repos. It's about oh, three or four hours drive north of Brisbane. And the turtles come up and lay their eggs from November to March. And uh, even though it's seasonal, uh, it brings, uh, yeah, brings a lot of... Um, uh, tourists into the area and they're not just spending at the turtles they're eating out at restaurants they're buying food at supermarkets they're filling the car at petrol stations so it really enhances the economy and the same thing with uh, o'reilly's rainforest retreat where we where we'll be in two days time actually uh, he did a study he and clem oh sorry clem tisdall and clyde wilson i said the name around the wrong way before Clem Tisdall and Clive Wilson, Clive Wilson uh, did a study also at um, O'Reilly's, found that it's the forest and the birds that really attract tourists there, day trippers as well as overnight. And again, they're spending on all sorts of things around Canungra and the general area while they're on their way up there, and that enhances the economy. And we'd like to get lots more of that happening uh, at more remote areas, out in the outback and so on where people are finding it hard to get jobs. And instead of going in for some of the more destructive things, if they can be starting uh, wildlife tourism, that's great. There's another aspect, though, to local residents. You know, we've got to stop them from trespassing onto people's property. If they see a kangaroo they want to uh, photograph or a rare bird or something, we don't really want them slipping onto fences and um, going through into places where the, uh, the owner of the land may not actually want them to be. Uh, also, some of the wildlife, actually, I'll just show you this. Um, 
See if I can get this working. This. Now, can you see, can you now see that rather blurred photo of fruit bats flying at dusk? I see your fruit bats flying at dusk. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have good photo on this one of that. that. I'll, I'll get on to the next, uh, mm -hmm. the next photo of a fruit bat. They're lovely animals. They fly. Yeah, can you see that? The fruit oh, bats? We see those yeah. photos. And um, thousands of them roost together. And they're a wonderful spectacle for tourists. We have tourists standing there watching them saying, gee, why isn't everyone out here? This is wonderful because just thousands and thousands of them going overhead. They're seeking uh, mostly native fruits and native flowers, um, like from the gum trees and the tea trees and all that. Uh, trouble is some people don't like them being uh, living near the houses because they make a bit of noise at dawn and dusk. And yeah, the collection of droppings can smell a bit if the wind goes the wrong way. And um, also some of the farmers whose orchards they occasionally raid aren't all that keen on them either, of course. So there's these conflicts that they're, they're a vital part of our ecosystems. They do a lot of pollinating of the plants. They disperse seeds of some of our rainforest plants. And they're, yeah, they're a part of our biodiversity, not always appreciated by local residents. So same with the Tasmanian devil when we can you see the tassie devil there i see the tassie devil yeah uh, they're the largest remaining marsupial predator we used to have the tasmanian tiger bounty was put on its head the thylacine it's not really a tiger of course it's a large marsupial that had stripes so they called it Tas tasmanian tiger the last one that we know of died in captivity in the 1930s we've still got the tasmanian devil and visitors to Tasmania really want to see the Tasmanian devil. And we're going to show them the Tassie devil during the conference. But farmers aren't always terribly happy when they come in and kill their chooks. So, yeah, there's conflicts there. Uh, if we go to other countries, they have even worse problems. Uh, Paul Kalelu, who we're trying to, he's a Maasai, who we're trying to bring across from Kenya, he's very much into um, wildlife conservation and seeing that the wild the migratory routes are preserved wildlife generally are preserved but being a cattle owner himself and being part of the maasai population he's very conscious of what these guys and his smaller relatives the leopards and the cheetahs can do to cattle and goats and we have to try and find some resolution there with the conflicts also um in Australia, we get cockatoos and crows and so on coming into crops. Sometimes no. wallabies. No, we're, but not, we're not seeing a cockatoo here, are we? No, 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 no. I'm just saying Africa has worse problems in their crops. Cockatoos do quite as much damage as these guys can do. So, uh, yeah, and Daniel Sambu, who we tried to bring to another conference, yeah, he's on the other side. Uh, who's doing a lot of work for wildlife conservation and also trying to accommodate the problems of the farmers. Uh, yeah, we just couldn't quite get enough money to bring him across, but still hoping we'll bring Paul across next year. Um, yeah, even some of the smaller animals like the boons are bigger than what we have in Australia. And, uh, yeah, we've actually arranged for Paul to stay at a few farms with, um, oh, that's, that's Paul's conservation company there that we started. Um, but, uh, yeah, we've arranged for Paul to actually stay overnight at a number of farms who are at where the landowner is preserving biodiversity as well as running a successful farm and swap ideas, swap, in, swap information against these two big southern continents, Africa and Australia, as to how we go about ensuring that the local population is looked after as well as the wildlife. I'm also hoping to bring across Wisdom Johnny uh, from Ghana, who is a journalist and he's now working at a, um, I think he's president of a African Heritage Society. And he's very concerned about 
wildlife conservation in Ghana and the possibilities of using uh, using wildlife tourism as a means for wildlife conservation. And um, now one second, one second. Uh, how did you get in touch with these folks in particular? Um, through okay. Facebook, I think. But uh, I think I got in touch with Paul. Actually, I can't really quite remember. But uh, Johnny, uh, sorry, Wisdom Johnny mm -hmm. is now a member of Wildlife Tourism Australia. And um, we spoke with Paul. We, we did a video Skyping with Paul at a previous conference in um, Geelong a couple of years ago. And this time we'd, we're hoping to get him out here in person. Um, yeah, uh, Wisdom Journey is also hoping to do a bit of um, postgraduate study in Australia sometime. So anyway, going on to where our conference is, um, looking at, you can see the map there. We do. We see that map. Good. And as you said, Tasmania is a little bit remote. Um, we are geographically almost part of Asia. I say almost because Wallace's Line runs between Bali and Lombok. Um, through Indonesia and Australia, New Zealand, New Guinea, we were all um, in contact with Antarctica 50 million years ago and quite separate from Asia, but we broke away from Antarctica and went sailing northwards. And um, so yeah, we are now very, very close to Asia, so next to Southeast Asia. But Tasmania is way down the southern end. And it's a very um, forested, very scenic, beautiful island. Uh, what on? Yeah, Tassie itself now. Okay, that little white circle you should be able to see there is Hobart, the capital of Tasmania. We were thinking of holding the conference there, easiest place for a lot of people to visit. But Launceston also has an airport, so even people coming from overseas can fly into Sydney or Melbourne and make the connection to Launceston, that little yellow circle up the top, top in the northeast. And uh, that is, a, that is um, on the edge of some lovely areas. And we are going to have our first, our first day of the conference there and the first night. And um, then can you see the green circle off to the left in the northwest uh, at Cradle Mountain? Um, halfway through the second day, we're going to, to um, uh, head on to a couple of coaches and be taken up to Cradle Mountain. So I'll just show a couple of photos of those. Uh, this is our venue for Launceston, where we'll spend the first night and the first morning of um, presentations and discussions. It's got quite an atmosphere to it. It's really quite a lovely little place just out of Hobart. As you see, it's not, uh, just out of Launceston, I mean. Yeah, it's not in a the city. There's wild ducks and honey eaters and other birds around. Not a lot of native vegetation just there, unfortunately. But we then head up to Cradle Mountain. And that is set next to the Cradle Mountain National Park with a lot of native vegetation. And just in a couple of hours, I saw... Uh, four of the endemic birds, that is birds found nowhere else except Tasmania. Saw the uh, grey currawong, the yellow wattle bird, the yellow fronted honey eater, and oh yeah, and the native bush hen actually. I saw the native bush hen on the way there. But also just down the road from there, we went for a little bit of a drive and saw lots of these guys, wombats. Uh, excuse see me, what, 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 what is a wombat? Well, it's the closest living relative to the koala. It's a herbivorous marsupial. If you can imagine that wombat with fluffy ears, turn him up 90 degrees and sit him in a tree and give him a slightly bigger nose, he'd be sort of koala-like. And both of them have backward facing pouches, uh, where the kangaroo uh, has, the has the opening of the pouch on the top. The wombat burrows on the ground, so that would be catching on everything going through the tunnels. So. The pouch opens out backwards, but it has good muscles and uh, the baby hangs on pretty tightly in there so it doesn't fall out. And the koala climbing through the trees, same thing had happened. If it was climbing over a branch and baby had an up, up, um, upward opening, so that's a backward opening too. 
and uh, they spend about six months in the pouch and then they can come in and out for a while and then after about a year they don't get in the pouch anymore. Um, but you can see here that we can actually get pretty close to the wombats. You see the wombat there that uh, that she's photographing just near the bushes? Um, it just might appear as a couple of grey rocks in that photo. <laughs> <laughs> the wombat. We saw about a dozen of them. So I we believe, thought, I, this I believe one. I see it, yeah, but that's uh, a good disguise. Okay. Yeah, uh, it does look like a hairy rock at first. Tony Conlon, who's one of our... Um, uh, one of our local organisers for the conference. He was the first one that spotted it. I think um, Sarah, who you can see there, and uh, Samantha rather, and myself, uh, mm -hmm. we just saw rocks and said, hey, there's a wombat, there's another one. Is oh, really? Yeah, so they are. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Tony's been in Tasmania for quite a long time. And uh, so we thought rather than set this conference in a city, for a wildlife tourism conference, it was much nicer to have this. Walk outside, see dozens of wild wombats. And we did see about a dozen of them just within half an hour or so. Also, just down the road, they're breeding Tasmanian devils, disease-free. And, um, yeah, this is some of, the, some of the devils they have there. So if you want to meet the devil, come down to the conference, and it's just down the road. Uh, they're also breeding our... Uh, breeding some smaller relatives of the Tasmanian devil. This is the eastern quoll that used to be all up, be up the eastern coast of the mainland of Australia. They're extinct there now, but they're still around in Tassie. So they're breeding those as well, and some of them are going to be released into New South Wales fairly soon. Um, so uh, yeah, we'll have a we'll have an excursion down there. So just to show you. I don't know where have we got now. Oh. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is just a room within the lodge, just to show you that although we're in the wilderness, it, uh, it's a very comfortable place. Oh, there's Tony with the hat over there looking at us from the photo. Cat uh, Davidson is their other uh, local organiser on our organising committee. What are their and, businesses? One, one second. What are their businesses called? Um, Tony is Wild Ways. Actually, it shows down the bottom of this tour. Wild Ways tour. They're going to uh, they're going to um, uh, help us for free with some transportation around um, uh, during the conference. But also, they're going to offer some discounted tours after the conference. Uh, they're down in southeast Tasmania, down to, towards Hobart, and they're going to offer some good um, discounted tours. Puan Bush Retreat, as you can see there, is close to Hobart. Uh, they're going to offer some discounts as well. And Wine Glass Bay Tours. And uh, it, you can see beautiful area there. And Hennicott Wilderness Journeys, also absolutely beautiful. Uh, they operate either in or out or close to Hobart. And, um, yeah, so... <laughs> Uh, Siri, I'll just get back to this now. Where are we? Back to the Hangouts. Right. Um, <laughs> hi. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, and uh, Tassie does have just wonderful wilderness, wonderful mountain scenery, beautiful forests, all different kinds of forests, mountain heaths, rocky coastlines with really spectacular scenery. Seals, penguins, uh, won't have whales, but yes, they will have whales still in October next year, I think. And um, the Tasmanian devil, loads of birds, loads of wombats. So it's a great place for a conference, and it'd be a shame for people to just come down for the conference and not see a little bit more of Tassie as well. Let me ask you a couple uh, quick questions uh, sure. in terms of wildlife tourism Australia. How often do you folks have a conference of this caliber? Well, we've, we've had three so far. Well, there was one conference in Tasmania that led to the formation of Wildlife Tourism Australia. We, needed, we decided we needed an association that really focused on good, ecologically sustainable wildlife tourism. We do have Ecotourism Australia. Uh, that's a very good association, and they do the eco-certifications. 
Um, but we also really concentrated on wildlife, both wild and captive. And um, because it's all part of wildlife tourism, but not the consumptive forms. We're not into uh, promoting hunting and hunting and fishing. Well, some of our operators also do a little bit of fishing sustainably, but we're not. Um, yeah, we're not into promoting. Certainly not into trophy hunting, anything like that. Um, and um, yeah, we're fo focusing largely on seeing wildlife in the wild, but also visiting good captive situations uh, that are good in terms of education, research, conservation, mostly with native animals, but um, exotic animals as well. For instance, um, Dream World on the Gold Coast has Tiger Island where they're breeding uh, Sumatran tigers and other tigers and using the tourism dollar that they do photographs with tigers and they have a lot of people watching the tigers putting coins in donation boxes and hopefully notes and checks in donation boxes as well. They apparently contribute more to tiger conservation financially than any other institution in the world. So yeah, we're happy to be involved with them as well. Um, and uh, yeah, oh, Adelaide Zoo is breeding some vulnerable species of crocodile from the Philippines, which I can't remember the name of right now. So although our main focus is wildlife in the wild in Australia, we also embrace other what? forms of wildlife tourism or what, that are good for conservation. While your, main conservation and research. while your main focus is on the wildlife in the wild, uh, you're saying yeah. that some of your members and some of the operations are in zoos. Uh, yes. What distinguishes, uh, what, what, makes a good, what, what, what makes a good zoo a good zoo? Yeah. Um, that that yeah. we can support. Sure. This this is one of the things that we are um, that we will be discussing quite a bit at the conference too. Uh, one that keeps the animals in a relatively natural setting. I mean, they can't be completely natural, as someone pointed out. Even in the the big two and a half acre plot with chimpanzees in Taronga Zoo with trees and creek and thing can't be really natural unless they had a leopard in there as well we're not we're not recommending that um, but the animal should be able to move around fairly freely uh, a social animal should not be kept alone I've seen some very lonely sad looking chimpanzees and other animals kept alone and getting absolutely neurotic yeah, they should be in a big enough family group. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, I've seen places where snakes are curled up in small enclosures. They can't stretch out. Well, I don't know what it feels like to be a snake, but I imagine they'd like to stretch out to their full length sometimes. And um, yeah, I heard Jane Goodall talk just recently yeah, when she visited Brisbane, and she was saying one of the main problems of captive animals is boredom. And active-minded animals, um, apes, monkeys, uh, I'd, I'd throw in cockatoos, even you know, magpies and other active-minded birds and mammals, they want to be out exploring and doing things, especially the young ones want room to play, they want things to play with, they want things to, to do. So, or for instance, going back to Taronga Park at um, Taronga Park Zoo in Sydney, in the chimpanzee enclosures, they've made um, artificial termite mounds. They've put mustard in, which the chimps like. They did try honey, but the bees liked it too much. And every day they throw in branches of bamboo. The chimps come along, they strip the bamboo the way they'd be stripping leaves in Africa. Probably not bamboo there, but same sort of thing, and start to fish for the mustard in the way that they would be fishing for termites. And uh, they give them other things to do. They give them coconuts to break open and so on. Uh, at uh, one sunbear enclosure, I saw at a little zoo that's now closed down, unfortunately, they'd throw in the fruit and vegetables the sunbear would like to eat, but it was all frozen in a block of ice. So the sunbear had to roll this ice around and decide what to do with it and gradually get bits out. Um, at the David Flay Wildlife Park. I was there 
on the birthday of one of their older dingoes. And they gave her a birthday present of sausages, but wrapped up in several layers of paper. So she had to get that out. So there's all sorts of ways that you can. You know, oh, and uh, Jane Goodall was actually saying that the chimpanzees love doing puzzles and you know computer programs and things that they can do. I thought, yeah, you know, doesn't seem terribly natural, but she said, oh no, they love it, and even if they're not getting reward, they still want to play with it. Um, so, yeah, um, so. Animal welfare in a zoo goes beyond just making sure the animal is healthy and breathe and breeding. It should be able to enjoy itself. Should be able to do some of the natural things, interact socially, play, investigate, explore new things. So yeah, so that's part of it. The zoo should also be supporting research. Um, and places like are supporting research not just within the zoo. Oh, and a lot of other zoos, are do a lot of the good zoos are doing this supporting research out in the field as well. And um, one thing I didn't mention Dreamworld is doing is paying salaries to rangers to uh, look after the tigers in Sumatra and I think now Siberia and a couple of other places as well. So, um, yeah, and the conservation aspect has two aspects. There's the breeding of rare animals to eventually be relocated. Like one of our members owns uh, the um, uh, Moonlit Sanctuary. Moon, uh, Moonlit Sanctuary down in um, uh, southern Victoria. And that just reminds me one thing I forgot. You asked me uh, where these people work. Tony works at Wild Ways. Kat Davidson, who was our, the other person on our organising committee, works with Inala on Bruni Island which is a marvellous place to visit and we'll have a discounted tour down there after the conference. Anyway, back to the Tigers. Back to, what on, back to something else. No, Moonlit Sanctuary. Um, at Moonlit Sanctuary, um, Michael Johnson is breed, breeding the orange-bellied parrot and other animals, but the orange belly is a highly endangered parrot and is now able to release some of their offspring into um back into the wild and there's um yeah the david flay wildlife park which i mentioned before started by zoologist david flay um largely for breeding rare and endangered wildlife um at the moment they're breeding prosopine rock wallabies they, they've they're from halfway up the coast of queensland and you know, being or more than halfway they're up in north queensland um they're being preyed upon by foxes and uh, feral dogs, stray dogs, even domestic dogs that are allowed to roam at night. So they're breeding them and then sending them to, um, uh, I think it's Hayman Island, off the coast from Proserpine, where there aren't any feral dogs, or well, there aren't any dogs at all, no foxes. So they're, they're doing very, very nicely on the island. One of the managers of the resort over there said that they're doing a little bit too well. <laughs> There's now quite a big population of the wallabies around. Um, yeah, uh, uh, David Flay's Corumban Wildlife Sanctuary, they're both members of WTA, and a couple of other places are also breeding the bilby. I don't have a photo here of the bilby, unfortunately. Um, in a way, they're sort of aardvark looking, but they're, they're, they're a... They're a beautiful little marsupial with rabbit-like ears, a long snout, and a tail which starts off black, a long tail that starts off black and then it's white, and very active little animals. There were two species, one's already extinct, so now we've just got one bilby. They're being led in captivity and taken, at, taken out to Cutterwinia National Park, where they've um, Frank Manthe and Peter McRae known as the Bilby Brothers, got together and um, started the Save the Bilby Fund. And um, especially Frank has um, found a lot of funding to build this fox-proof, cat-proof, rabbit-proof fence around 25 square kilometres. National Park way out in the outback, about 1,200 kilometres west of Brisbane. Bees, unfortunately, the fence got damaged by floods. Cats got in again. They got rid of the cats again, and now the bilbies are breeding up again. So, yeah, this sort of thing is really good 
conservation breeding that can eventually release animals back into the wild. Even those that don't have anywhere to release them as yet, um, it's better to have the animal than not to have it, hoping someday there will be a safe place to release them. Um, then the other aspect of conservation work in zoos is education. That um, zoos are there for enjoyment, for family picnics and so on, but they should also be letting people know a bit about the ecology of these animals and the behaviour and partly just to arouse uh, appreciation of you know, what fascinating creatures they are and also to let them know what some of the needs of the animals are and how we can help, like at the gorilla enclosure in Melbourne. Um, right next to that, there's a display of mobile phones and saying when you're finished with your mobile phone, don't just toss it out. Here's how, to you, how you recycle it, because the gorilla's habitat in the Congo, some of it is being destroyed, mining for the rare minerals that are needed to make new mobile phones. So you can help gorillas by recycling rather than encouraging more and more forest to be destroyed for, for mining. Um, at Taronga, Actually, and, and also at Melbourne Zoo, near the orangutans, they have displays of foods that do and don't contain uncertified palm oil because so much of the orangutans' habitat has been destroyed in Southeast Asia to grow more and more and more palm oil plantations. Now, there's nothing wrong with the palm oil itself. What is wrong is that forests are being cleared for it. So there are some sustainable palm oil plantations that didn't clear more forest for them and aren't going to clear anymore, but these that are clearing more and more forest. And it's not just the orangutans, it's the pygmy elephants, the proboscis monkeys, and all the other wildlife that live there that are, are having their homes destroyed. And yeah, it's quite frightening when you see some of the satellite images of the extent that used to be of the forest and how it's now dwindling. So, uh, yeah, that's another um, thing that the zoos are doing, telling us what products to buy, what products not to buy to support wildlife conservation. And, um, yeah, just going back now to a, uh, not to a zoo, but accommodation, um, Albert Tao, who was our um, keynote speaker at the... Um, conference in Adelaide last year. Oh, and just to answer one of your previous questions, so <clears throat> we've decided now to have conferences once every second year because it just there's just so much work involved in organising it and we're all volunteers organising it that we've decided every year is a bit too much. We'll have conferences every second year, but we have some smaller workshops in between. Anyway, Albert Tao has a beautiful eco-lodge, which I'd love to visit someday, in Borneo, in Sabah. And he's, uh, he's getting funding now to, uh, to open another venture which will help to create corridors for orangutans to move between patches of forest. So, um, yeah, and um, another of our members, Cedar Creek Estates, they're basically a winery, but they built an artificial cave in which they can breed and doing so very, very successfully, glowworms to take the pressure off the natural populations of glowworms, which were getting a bit too damaged, people shining too many torches on them, breathing on them, touching them and so on, and getting them to turn their lights off and then starving, because our glowworms are not the larvae of the fireflies like your glowworms are. Our glowworms are little fungus gnats. The, um, while I'm doing this, the uh, larva lies in a hammock. It builds a little hammock under the, or the overhang over a creek or whatever. And it grows up to about an inch long and lies in the hammock, has little sticky strands hanging down and one end of it glows. So as one of the guides puts it, little insects flying through, they see starry sky, they fly up to the skies and the skies eat them. So yeah, the glowworm depends on glowing to attract its prey. So if people are getting the, turn their lights off, 
yeah, it's not good for them. And um, so Cedar Creek Estate started this um, beautiful cave with stalactites and stalagmites and little clear crystal streams and everything. They put in about 300 glowworms. Now they've got thousands of them. And uh, they turn night into day, fill the, fill the uh, glowworms. And think it's time for glowing. And they take, they, uh, take groups through there every half hour or so. Uh, they've also um, grown rainforest along their creek as part of a wildlife corridor, and that's having success. They're getting melted, mountain brush tail possums and carpet pythons and all sorts of other creatures moving through there now, and they've, yeah, they've got a wonderful uh, forest there after a, only 13 years. Of course, it'll take it to the really mature forest, but um, it's already good wildlife habitat and it's linking other habitats. So, um, yeah, that, and, um, yeah, O'Reilly's, another of our members in, in next to Lamington National Park, O'Reilly's Rainforest Retreat. Uh, they've been very supportive of researchers going in there and doing research. In fact, Wildlife Tourism Australia has started a, a, the Australian Wildlife Research Network, getting wildlife tour operators who are in, interested and ecologists and zoos interested in wildlife research in touch with each other. Also, uh, accommodation places in touch with academic research uh, and offering f free or discounted accommodation, um, and also sometimes helping them as research assistants, uh, getting, uh, get, getting researchers in touch with zoos and wildlife parks that will give them free entry to come in and sit there and do some of the research on animal behaviour, and also letting tourists know places that they can volunteer as research assistants. So, um, yeah, there's a lot that can, there's a lot that is being done and there's a lot more that can be done by, by zoos, wildlife parks, by eco lodges and by wildlife tour operators for research, for research, for basic wildlife research and for conservation. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, it's 2017. Uh, how has wildlife tourism changed it? compared to 1997 or 2007? I think it's become somewhat more sophisticated. We're, uh, we've seen a lot of the terrible little zoos closed down, um, ones that um, uh, kept lonely bear pacing around in a cement and barred cage. Um, we've seen more emphasis on education in some of the displays. We still get um, entertainment uh, entertainment displays with seals and so on uh, doing basically tricks for the audience, but we're seeing more and more interpretation about the animal's behaviour, Look, like as uh, just going back to that termite mounds in Taronga, when they're throwing in the... Uh, the uh, bamboo shoots for the chimpanzees to uh, to strip down. They're talking about what the uh, what the chimpanzees do out in the wild. Uh, way back, if we go right back to the 1950s, they used to dress the chimpanzees up in cute little costumes and give them tea parties. Now that was cute, but it didn't tell people much about the ecology or behaviour of chimpanzees. So yeah, we have seen. Gradually, the um, interpretation at zoos is getting better and better. Um, there's still lots of room for improvement in lots of places. And uh, Wildlife Tourism Australia, in fact, has just hosted or run two wildlife interpretation workshops. We held one at uh, Binnaburrah in southeast Queensland last year on face to face interpretation uh, called. Enjoyable, memorable, and meaningful. It has to be enjoyable for the tourists. They're on holidays. They don't want to be sat down in the classroom. It has to be something they can enjoy, being out there in the wild, seeing the animals, talking to people who are friendly, and yeah, a little bit of humour thrown in amongst the interpretation. But it also has to be, and it has to be memorable. It's no good giving a whole lot of facts. They're going to forget as soon as they go away. So we talked about, yeah. You know, what do we do to make it memorable that people will remember 
some of the main points about these animals and about their behaviour and their ecology and their ecological needs and how to make it like um, uh, on, a, um, on a marine excursion, for instance, going and seeing the turtles and the marine birds, talking about just in between. You don't want to depress everyone by too much doom and gloom, but mentioning along the way that they do swallow bits of plastic. And there's a hell of a lot of plastic ending up in our oceans nowadays. Um, a turtle will see a plastic bag, think it's a, um, a squid or something, and swallow it, and it sticks in its in, uh, digestive system. Even whales can suffer because tiny bits of plastic, even when plastic bags and other things break down into tiny, tiny pieces, loads of these tiny pieces can end up amongst the plankton that the whales are eating. And other animals eat plankton as well. And it's just incredible the amount of plastic that show in animal stomachs and um, can lead to starvation, can lead to all sorts of problems if they get a blockage. Uh, anyway, so. When you go home, try not to use disposable plastic bags. Uh, try and reduce your disposable plastic litter. Um, try, you know, now, actually, Australia now, or most of our states, are trying to do away with disposable plastic bags, which is great. Um, and yeah, South Australia years ago brought in recycled glass bottles, which I'm sure California and other American states have had for years too. Queensland is just now starting to adopt that, which is good. And I hope some of the other, I, I was part of the campaign back in South Australia in the 70s and we got that put through and thought the other states would follow straight away, but they haven't, they're taking the time. But it's gradually happening. So yeah, but that, but that sort of thing we can tell people, when you go home, these are some of the things you can do. Buy fish from sustainable fisheries, uh, not the sort that are going to fish out everything. And for the Barrier Reef, I've actually um, I've just interviewed Professor Justin Marshall, who um, is primarily a neurologist, but he most of his work is with co um, colour vision in fish. So he's been visiting the reefs for decades, and he's seen a tremendous decline in life on the reef in the, in the northern parts. There's still some wonderful places. So, you know, people coming to see the Great Barrier Reef, there are still some wonderful places you can see. But we've lost over half of it. And, um, but is that there are things we can do. Try and use less fossil fuels. Uh, that's the main thing, actually. Let's, you know, really push for more renewable energy slow down climate change as much as we can, um, support the politicians that are supporting uh, reducing uh, fossil fuels, etc. So um, yeah, so that's why we mean enjoyable, memorable and meaningful. What you can actually do with the, what the tourists can go away and not make big changes to their life, but yeah, some things they might think about. Okay, then we held another wildlife interpretation workshop this year in July up in North Queensland. And this time, instead of focusing on face-to-face -face interpretation, uh, sometimes you can reach a wider audience, although face-to-face -face is often better if you've got a good guide, but you can sometimes reach a wider audience by signs, by apps, uh, videos, and other things, so we focused on that. Um, just while we're on the subject of workshops, um, another, prob uh, another big problem throughout the world for wildlife, of course, is wildlife trafficking. And we, we hear a lot about ivory, tiger parts, rhino horns. Don't hear so much about pangolin scales, but uh, they've got it worse than anything, really, because not so many people know about pangolin, but their scales are being trafficked, but even here in Australia we have our problems. Um, cockatoos, snakes, um, thorny devil lizards, frill neck lizards, others are bit, and various parrots. It's a multi-million dollar industry in the exotic pet trade. And um, there's lots more that we could be doing to halt that. 
at, so we had another wild, we had a wildlife tourism, sorry, an illegal wildlife trafficking workshop in Sydney in June this year to talk about what needs to be done. Uh, we said attacking on all fronts, what needs to be done in our shipping ports, our airports for detecting what's leaving the country as well as what's coming in and how tour, tour operators are in a good position, again, to educate their guests on what not to buy, innocently thinking, uh, yeah, this must be legitimate, but sometimes not. Uh, also, what to keep an eye out for, any signs of suspicious activity out there in the bush, that um, suddenly there's a whole lot of cages that might be for illegal collection of parrots or lizards or something, you know, anything that's... And um, wildlife witness, we had a... Uh, that's an app produced by Taronga Zoo. We had a representative from Taronga Zoo at our conference. It's a little app you can get to anonymously report suspicious, um, suspicious activity anywhere in the world, including Australia, of course. So, um, yeah, there's a number of ways that tourists and tour operators can uh, Contribute to wildlife conservation. Well done. And, uh, oh, the blog. Oh, sorry. The interview that I did with Justin Marshall is on the main wildlife tourism website now. Uh, it, in fact, it's the most recent blog. So if you just go to the right-hand side of the main website, wildlifetourism.org.au, and go to the blog on the right, you can read that whole interview with Justin. I hear Sorry. Okay. Let me see if I can share my screen. And walk walk me through this. Okay. Yeah, that's the main um, that's that's the main uh, website homepage. I don't know why so much maybe you can widen your window a bit. Yeah, that's that's looking better. Okay. Now coming yeah, there's coming events. Um, if you did click on that, you'd see a little bit more about the conference in Tasmania. It's going to be a lot more soon. But over to the right, recent posts, can we save the Great Barrier Reef? And interview okay, with that's Professor that's Jasper. Interview. Yeah. And down below that, there's a couple of other things about the Great, Bar Great Barrier Reef as well. You know, one second. I'm just taking a look uh, at this conference sure, information. The... So it's October 28th to yeah. the 31st. Of next year. That's right. Yeah. And um, I've shown that picture there deliberately because it's a sort of an interaction between human wildlife that's very friendly. Um, there's a lot of controversy as to how close we should get to wildlife, whether we should interact with wildlife either in the wild or captivity. And what I'm wanting to uh, one of the main things I want to discuss in, in those terms is what really matters to the wildlife. Now, this bird just came up to us in the forest of his own accord. And sometimes we're having lunch and a honey eater or a bower bird will arrive on the table right next to us. And I say, now, don't you know that people say you're going to be stressed if you come within five metres of us? I mean, there's all sorts of situations. And um, there's a big controversy as to whether or not we should feed wildlife. Uh, if we are going to feed wildlife, under what circumstances, how should we do it properly, and so on. Um, but there's there's some extreme views. <laughs> we must, yeah, you know, we must allow feeding, and we must allow a lot of interaction to get. No, wildlife must remain wild. We mustn't ever get anywhere near it. Only view it through binoculars. But there's a whole spectrum in between that, and. Uh, one of the things I want to really try and discuss is what really matters to the animal. What really does, what really does disturb the animal? What things don't really disturb the animal as much as we might think it does? And what things could the animal actually enjoy? Like some of these swims with dolphins in the wild, not so much in the aquarium, but swimming in the wild with dolphins, whales, seals. The animal has the whole ocean to swim out into. It doesn't have to come up to us. Like the minke whales up north, um, another of our members, um, um, Eye to Eye Encounters, I think it's called, with right. John Rumney. Um, yeah, he said it's a real life-changing experience for people to go 
um, diving with them and then this big minky whale with this enormous eye comes right up next to you and looks at you. It's quite, uh, the, you know, the true meaning of awesome. And um, Well said. And I want to show you, this is the Planeta yeah. page about today's Hangout. So we'll be adding a few of the, the links that yeah. we're mentioning. But I think I've yeah. done a pretty fair job of adding the links to Wildlife Tourism Australia in your wombat feeding video, which is wonderful. Um, wombat feeding? Oh, yeah. We're not feeding the wombats. They're feeding themselves. Yeah, actually, are you able to just play that? Would that show? I'm not sure. We're going to, well, let's, I'm Good. not sure. Let's see. You can, you can almost see the, um, oh, yeah, it is. When he looks at you, can you see the koala connection? They are related to koalas. If you can imagine those big ears, bigger and fluffier, the nose bigger, it can almost look like a koala. They are the, the remaining closest living relative of our koalas. And but, here's um, a page yeah. about your host venue. Yep. Good, Launceston. Um, Launceston's not quite on the... So if you follow the river up... Oh, the river, okay. And that's yeah, what the Kanamaluka... Yeah, it's close to the coast. Yeah, that's so, right. And and the, it's it's near the Tamar River that we'll be staying on that first night. Oh so yes, if you have a better picture, yeah, of of that, I will be putting that, that would be. Uh, I will be putting some. Of course. Yeah, I think we're um, I think we're at the, we're at a position where we can let people know about the event. Hopefully. Uh, collaborate and and share a little bit about what's happening in Australia with wildlife and wildlife tourism um, you know so many good resources are out there for people who are again looking to be the responsible traveler and wanting to learn about nature and uh, and as I say not, not be a negative impact so I'm really happy to have these conversations with you and again my best wishes for your event. It sounds fantastic. Thank you. And uh, we've already got people coming from Japan and uh, one from Germany wants to come. There's at least three from Japan that are definitely coming. And uh, so it's a national event, but we're certainly uh, getting a lot of interest. And it's, it's great to be able to exchange information and views with people from other, from other areas. Well, how did you tackle this problem? What's the situation there? Etc. Right. That sounds great. I want to wrap up our video hangout at this point, but I want to ask: Do you have anything for show and tell? Any physical item you'd like to show us before we go? All right. Actually, um, this came out of our conference in um, in um, Geelong a couple of years ago. Uh, Ismar de Lima from Brazil asked me afterwards, um, "Hey, would you like to edit the book on wildlife tourism with me?" I said, sure, not realizing. That, oh, sorry, that's one of my dogs getting excited. I hear wildlife. <laughs> um, I think they're going outside now, which is good. Um, yeah, I didn't realize that a lot of the authors would be from South America, Asia, Europe, in countries where English is not their first language. So the editing sure took a few hours. It finally came out in May this year. Um, uh, actually, I've got another book alongside of me, which I've self-published a couple of um, couple of years back. I um, that'll be available. Uh, I'm doing a new edition, and I want to make that a little bit more international. That'll be available, discounted at the uh, at the conference. Um, yeah, that's a that 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 one is a hand guide for uh, business startup students mm -hmm. uh, guides, etc. Uh, whereas the other is more uh, a combination of um, research projects and reviews of um, wildlife tourism and especially uh, the, sus the sustainability and the interpretation aspects and the ethical aspects of wildlife tourism from various countries. I'd like to do a follow-up on that someday. <laughs> well, Rada, I want to say thank you again for the time. Uh, uh, you stay online. We'll have our post chat yeah. chat but uh i want to okay. thank people for watching it's been an hour and we've had a great conversation uh to members of wildlife tourism australia if you're watching this later on let, 
let us know if you can participate in a in a, another hangout. I only ask that since I'm on the other side of the Pacific from you to see if you can make some time in, in your morning so that I can have a conversation my previous afternoon. Okay, and thank I'll, I'll say thanks to everyone too for uh, watching and hopefully participating in the future. No doubt.